Face. I, I kind of got stuck on horizon line paintings because it was a really good way to help a student um, put impose a composition on their painting without it being too much. So I paint completely intuitively. For me to say I'm going to start an abstract at landscape is really more commitment than I usually like. I just start painting. I want my artist statement to read, I just paint. I, I don't have any esoteric reason for painting. I just love it. It's been my passion my whole life and I, I just do it. And I do it intuitively with no plan. I try to start out with no idea. Um, not really even a color um, system that I'm gonna use, which was a little hard to figure out which paints to bring because I didn't know what I was gonna do. So it always just happens and it just comes to me as I go. And um, So, and this is graphite. This is a, a 6B uh, graphite and it's um, uh, water soluble. So it'll make a smeary mess if I use too much of it. And then just a pencil. Okay, so that's how I start. And then I'm going to take some white paint, or and generally I use gesso, but I didn't bring the gesso today, I brought white paint. Are these watercolors or acrylics? These are acrylics. So these are the fluid acrylics that Golden makes. Um, they're a little bit more translucent than your tube acrylics, they're thinner. And I like them because I generally use the paint thin, but lately I've been using the heavy body which comes in the tubes like this. And um, so today I'm using a combo of both. So they're more translucent, not because they're watered down, but because they're not as thick. They have the same amount of pigment in them as the tubes do. So for brushes, this one got bent on the way. Um, I like golden Taclon brushes, the Taclon fiber. Um, for me, this has, um, enough of a bounce to it, um, but most of the white fiber brushes that they recommend for acrylics um, are too stiff and they leave brush marks. And I'm not a fan of brush marks. I do a lot of blending to get rid of the brush marks. So this particular one is a um, silver brush. Um, and um, I do work with silver brush, so they give me some, if I fill out my reports and do my paperwork, they'll give me some brushes. <laughs> um, so it's a um, crystal, um, golden natural blend. So it's a blend of both natural fiber and golden Taclon fiber. So it's, um, it's a very responsive brush. So now this paint and with the water in it is going to smear some of these marks and not other ones. And um, I like that little bit of smeariness because it starts building the tonality in the painting. It's because when you're working intuitively, the problem is always where do I put the paintbrush down next? You know, you've got to figure it out. So it, and when it gives me some tonality and um, some depth, it kind of helps that problem. Although, as you can see, I'm going over it kind of deliberately um, so it doesn't smear too much because when it smears too much, then I just get a gray, muddy mess, and then I don't know what to do. It is again, the same reason as what I've got here, is that it's a translucent color, and if you spread it out, it goes from yellow to orange, all in one jar. So I can get, again, I can get some tonality with that. See that, it's yellow? and it's orange. And at this point, I'm just putting paint down and I'm working really quickly. And um, the white's not quite dry, but so I'm just letting it blend in with the, the quick gold. A lot of times I will, um, knock back the quick gold a little bit with um, a little bit of raw umber. 
And that's because it, it starts looking like a fire it happened on my painting. If I don't knock it back a little bit, you can also use a little bit of Payne's gray or another um, greenish color in it. You know, if you want to knock it back, you go to the complement. But I find that raw umber, or it's nice with black as well. See, there it is with the raw umber in it. It gives it a little earthy quality. I'm using my brush going in all different directions, and I'm really hard on brushes. Um, these silver brushes hold up pretty well to it. Um, they're, um, other than that, I don't usually spend a lot of money on brushes because I ruin them a lot. Somebody was telling me about somebody's studio the other day, and they said that their studio was such a mess that you would walk in and the brushes would be glued to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I make a mess, but it's not quite that bad. <laughs> so this is a Liquitex color. It's called Indian Yellow. They've got one I really like called Turner Yellow, but I'm out of it. Um, Golden has an Indian yellow as well, but it's it's not um, quite as warm or as um, opaque as the liquid chaps. So I'm going to go ahead and put my horizon line in. Now when you do your horizon line, you want to stay by the rule of thirds. So you want it a third down or a third up. And I'm gonna do that. This is a, a Blick Payne's Gray. And Blick's Payne's Gray is very, um, if I bleed it out, it comes out to a dark brown, where Golden's comes out to an indigo blue. So there's a lot of difference in Payne's Gray from brand to brand. But if I use it for a mark, it looks very black. So there's my horizon. I want to use a color in one place, I want to use it in a couple more. I quit on the yellow because it was so close to the um, Quinn Gold, it really wasn't making any difference. I want to take some of this off. So you can use sandpaper. and brick some of that um, collage back up a little bit. The other time to use open is, um, I've had some students that are fans of Gerhard Richter, if you know his paintings, and he does an abstract painting, very large, like eight and 10 feet, and then he puts another painting over the top of them with oils, and then he takes a squeegee and takes it off. So that would be a good use for open, would be to put that second layer on there and take that squeegee and take it off. Why would he do that? Hmm? Why would he do that? Does it leave some there or? Yeah, it leaves some there and take some off. So the same here, this is taking some off and making um, some marks on here that I couldn't get. If you're working on wood, you can use an actual sander if you're working on a wood panel.
So this is green gold, which is a very yellow green shapes. And you have my permission to abuse anybody that says, I see a face, <laughs> I see a horse. <laughs> For my friend who I see is an angel in my paintings, Miss Jeanette. <laughs> In Michigan, she's always like, there's the angel, I see her. Uh, but you should have small, medium, and large shapes of color. And they should be kind of spread around the um, canvas. So right now, this area here is kind of my large. And even though it's not one color, it kind of reads as one color. And then the, I don't have anything else much going on for me here shape-wise. <clears throat> I wish there was a hole in my bag when I was here. I've got tight green panels in my car. It's a lovely color. It's like um, <coughs> Titan Buff, which I have here, with a teeny bit of a gray, of a green gray in it. Try <coughs> mixing something similar. <coughs> it's not too far off. I'm always blending the edges of the colors because I, I don't really want pronounced shapes. I've actually been challenging myself to leave shapes within my paintings. I also do a lot of this kind of mark making. And lately I've also been doing some scraping. Just to get some different looks going on with the paint. In general, um, if I'm doing sort of a sky thing, I want the sky to be lighter um, than the rest of it, just because um, that's how we experience our earth, is the sky being lighter, if we want a pleasant feeling. When an unpleasant feeling is when the sky gets really dark, you're getting storms. So if you want a stormy, threatening sort of feel, then you want to make your sky darker. But I prefer happy paintings, so I'm making mine lighter. And since I'm working in mostly analogous colors, I have not rinsed my brush out. And I'm usually working with dirty water. I know that doesn't work in watercolors. Um, but for me, the working in dirty water, I'm, I tend to use really saturated color. And so working with dirty water sort of cuts that saturation back a little bit so they're not so knock you in the face kind of paintings. you can see the scraping in there that I did and that's not a mark I could get with a brush a little bit 
Puh. And this is where I set that black um, concrete marker acts a little bit as a resist. So this scrapes right off of it. Are you working on canvas? Yes, it's a stretch canvas. And um, canvases, I might, um, my canvas is from Jerry's Artorama called the Edge Canvas. Um, it's interesting, I have a gallery show up in Cincinnati at Beta Gallery and they hung the show and um, they had some um, students helping them hang the show. And the one student said she hung the one in the windows because she could see through the canvas. I'm like, oh, that's not really a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that must have probably been a big box door canvas that I had laying around. And the edge ones um, uh, have more body to them. And they have, um, on the back, they have this extra frame in the back. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have a lot of splinters on it. So it stays pretty square um, because of the two frames in the back and you don't see any staples whatsoever. So, and they're fairly inexpensive. They're not as cheap as 70% off at Michael's or whatever they do, but they, um, they, they do the job. I think these are like $14 and they are um, in Plaza in Cincinnati. Uh, 16 by 20 and the uh, Frederick's brand is going to run you um, close to 40. Mm -hmm. So it's um, a good price if you're going to buy a better canvas. Golden had reports that the paint was popping off of some of the big box canvases. And I actually had it happen to me on, and it was on a, a very plain horizon line canvas and a little, just a little bitty quarter inch <laughs> circle popped off right at the horizon line and I had to go back and fix it. So that doesn't bode well for um, long lasting. I'm not big on archival stuff. I just want it to last my lifetime and it's somebody else's problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't want to see something on somebody's wall that I sold them um, a couple years ago and have it be um, faded or um, coming apart. And I, um, I started painting in high school, which was 50 years ago. And I've got on my walls at home a four by four foot abstract that I did in high school. And I actually did some art shows in high school and sold paintings. And um, so some of the stuff that I still have from that time period is sort of disintegrating. Um, so it's, it has lasted up my lifetime. I put the blue in hopes it'll come off as green because it's, it's this is manganese blue you which is very transparent I don't know if you know about golden colors but the transparent with the transparency is on the front there's a black and white striped thing on the label and then they hand paint each label so the Cornacrino Nickel Azo Gold is very transparent. If I hold it this way, you can see it now. And the white is uh, mostly translucent.
Um, I've known about this palette for a long time, and I just started last week working from it, and I am just really enjoying having these colors be still wet when I go to use them. And what do you cover your paints with? Tracing paper? No. Tracing paper is under the paints, yeah. and then at night I usually cover them with press and seal so it doesn't go down into the paints. It's too separate from the top and the bottom. I thought this might pull it together, but it didn't. So it looks like two different paintings. I just tell people that um, when you see a painting that you like, whether you're in a gallery or a, you know a show, or um, doesn't matter where you are, but if you see something that just stops you in your tracks, stay there. Look at that painting and try to decide what drew you to that painting. And if you do that, and maybe take a couple notes, pretty soon you'll know what it is that you want to incorporate in your paintings, where you want your paintings to go. And you'll be able to build a series of paintings. And for me, I never used white. And um, I started doing that and realized that I was really drawn to high contrast abstracts. And um, so I started using a lot more white in my paintings and um, worked out much better. Now I tell students to use white so often it's become a joke in the classroom. If anybody wants to drive to Cincinnati, I do teach. Um, I've known about this palette for a long time, and I just started last week working from it, and I am just really enjoying having these colors be still wet when I go to use them. And what do you cover your paints with? Tracing paper? No. Tracing paper is under the paints, yeah. and then at night I usually cover them with press and seal so it doesn't go down into the paints. It's too separate from the top and the bottom. I thought this might pull it together, but it didn't. So it looks like two different paintings. I 
always tell people that um, when you see a painting that you like, whether you're in a gallery or a, you know a show, or um, doesn't matter where you are, but if you see something that just stops you in your tracks, stay there. Look at that painting and try to decide what drew you to that painting. And if you do that and maybe take a couple notes, pretty soon you'll know what it is that you want to incorporate in your paintings, where you want your paintings to go. And you'll be able to build a series of paintings. And for me, I never used white. And um, I started doing that and realized that I was really drawn to high contrast abstracts. And um, so I started using a lot more white in my paintings and um, worked out much better. Now, I tell students to use white so often it's become a joke in the classroom. If anybody wants to drive to Cincinnati, I do teach on the shapes. And you have my permission to abuse anybody that says, I see a face, <laughs> I see a horse. <laughs> my friend who I see is an angel in my paintings, <laughs> Miss Jeanette, <laughs> and Michigan, she's always like, there's the angel, I see it. Uh, but you should have small, medium, and large shapes of color, and they should be kind of spread around the um, canvas. So right now, this area here is kind of my large, and even though it's not one color, it kind of reads as one color. And then the, I don't have anything else much going on for me here, shape-wise. hole in my bag when I was here. I've got <coughs> tight green panels in my car. It's a lovely color. It's like um, <coughs> tight and buff, which I have here. With a teeny bit of a gray, of a green gray in it. try <coughs> mixing something similar. <coughs> I'm always blending the edges of the colors because I, I don't really want pronounced shapes. I've actually been challenging myself to leave shapes within my paintings. I also do a lot of this kind of mark making. And lately I've also been doing some scraping. to get some different looks going on with the paint. And in general, um, if I'm doing sort of a sky thing, I want the sky to be lighter um, than the rest of it, just because um, that's how we experience our earth, is the sky being lighter, if we want a pleasant feeling. When an unpleasant feeling is when the sky gets really dark, you're getting storms. So if you want a stormy, threatening sort of feel, then you want to make your sky darker. But I prefer happy paintings, so I'm making mine lighter.
And since I'm working in mostly analogous colors, I have not rinsed my brush out. And I'm usually working with dirty water. I know that doesn't work in watercolors. Um, but for me, the working in dirty water, I'm, I tend to use really saturated color. And so working with dirty water sort of cuts that saturation back a little bit so they're not so knock you in the face kind of paintings. See, you can see the scraping in there that I did. And that's not a mark I could get with a brush. A little bit more. And this is where I said that black um, concrete marker acts a little bit as a resist. So this scrapes right off of it. Are you working on canvas? Yes, it's a stretch canvas. And um, canvas is, I might, um, my canvas is from Jerry's Artorama called the Edge Canvas. Um, it's interesting, I have a gallery show up in Cincinnati at Beta Gallery and they hung the show and um, they had some um, students helping them hang the show. And the one student said she hung the one in the windows because she could see through the canvas. I'm like, oh, that's not really a good thing. <laughs> so that must have probably been a big box door canvas that I had laying around. And the edge ones um, uh, have more body to them. And they have, um, on the back, they have this extra frame in the back. And it doesn't have a lot of splinters on it. So it stays pretty square. Um, because of the two frames in the back and you don't see any staples whatsoever. So, and they're fairly inexpensive. They're not as cheap as 70% off at Michael's or whatever they do, but they, um, they, they do the job. I think these are like $14 and they are um, in Plaza in Cincinnati. Uh, 16 by 20 and the um, Frederick's brand is going to run you um, close to 40. So it's um, a good price if you're going to buy a better canvas. Golden had reports that the paint was popping off of some of the big box canvases. And I actually had it happen to me on, and it was on a, a very plain horizon line canvas and a little, just a little bitty quarter inch <laughs> circle popped off right at the horizon line and I had to go back and fix it. So that doesn't bode well for um, long lasting. I'm not big on archival stuff. I just want it to last my lifetime and it's somebody else's problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't want to see something on somebody's wall that I sold them um, a couple years ago and have it be um, faded or um, coming apart. And I, um, I started painting in high school, which was 50 years ago. And I've got on my walls at home a four by four foot abstract that I did in high school. And I actually did some art shows in high school and sold paintings. And um, so some of the stuff that I still have from that time period is sort of disintegrating. Um, so it's, it has lasted up my lifetime. I put the blue in hopes it'll come off as green because it's, it's, this is manganese blue U, which is very transparent. I don't know if you know about golden colors, but the transparent with the transparency is on the front. There's a black and white striped 
thing on the label and then they hand paint each label. So the quinacridone nickel azole gold is very transparent. If I hold it this way, you can see it now. And the white is uh, mostly translucent. Here's a um, student told me about it. It's called a Frank Lloyd Wright um, rule of design. And that if you put a diagonal across like this, what's happening here should be happening here. But if it happens, it should be half of what's happening here. Two to one, making three. I really like those lines in there. That there. And this blending that I'm doing is how I keep the paint from looking like it just went on top of something. Um, you know, obviously the layer underneath it is dry. So by sort of modeling the layer that's underneath it, it looks like it's been, always been there. It doesn't look like I just sat some brown on top of it. Because I have a very green painting by going across the color wheel, making a little focal point, it always kind of wakes it up. And of course, when you use it in the focal area, you have to use it in a couple other places too. So just tints of it here and there. So I think that, brown, that brown down at the bottom looks like shimmers of gold, that vertical line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably would be helpful if I looked at it up there. <laughs> it's always really helpful to take a picture with your phone. Mm -hmm. 
you know, take a good look at it, that one degree of separation. And the other thing is to take a picture of it, turn it into black and white, and um, then you can see that you've got um, a lot of gray, gray tones within your darks and lights. So I always try to have dark, medium, and light tones. So, is there questions? We're not close, but do you see any of your original words up there that you had on there? No. <laughs> Let me try to find some. I'd like to see some. <laughs> it's hard on a canvas to, to sand it back. Uh -huh. uh, Shapes when you paint? No. Mm -hmm. No, I forgot that they were boats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if I was working longer on this, I'd probably try harder to bring some of those out. Um, can you use um, some rubbing alcohol? And um, that would lift some of the paint up. How do you know when you're finished? <laughs> <laughs> that is always the question. And it's I so heard changed from when you first started. Yeah. I heard a good description recently that um, finishing a painting is like finishing a dinner. If you feel like you're full and it was just a wonderful dinner and you really enjoyed it, if you have that feeling when you finish a painting, that means it's finished. If you just have the feeling like, well, that was a frozen pizza. <laughs> so if you were to do calligraphy on top of that, would you have to make some super matte medium with some paint? No. Uh, for calligraphy, I've been using... I was using golden high flow for calligraphy, and I like the calligraphy in white. And um, it's not it, it's not opaque enough. It was when it first came out, and now when I'm getting it, it's more watery. So Holbein has a product called um, Super Opaque White Ink, and um, it's really good. And I just write right over the, as, as long as I would, I should have, if I was going to do calligraphy on here, I would have mixed super matte medium in my paint, but not in the ink that I'm putting on the paints. But, and then I often use gesso for white, which keeps things flat and chalky. So, I don't know how big this will write. Answer that would be not at all. <laughs> so I often put writing along the horizon line. Like that. Is that a concrete marker? This is a concrete marker. So this is called asemic writing, so it's a semantic, non-legible writing. And it's really big in art these days, and, and really big in the calligraphic world. Um, that um, lovely organic free marks. I was telling Connie, I was in France a couple weeks ago, and we saw the marks in the cave paintings, and they were just wonderful gestural marks. And to get a good gestural mark, you have to put your whole body into the mark. You wouldn't get a good mark if your arm is tucked in here, and you're writing like this. But if you're doing this and your body is moving like you're dancing with the painting, then you're going to get a good mark. Is that long enough? <laughs> wow. wow. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you.